Good morning, everyone. It is Wednesday, March the 10th, 2021. It is currently 8.16 a.m. Central Time, and I'm here at Victory Baptist Church for a couple of hours of live broadcasting. Hopefully, you're able to listen to us live. If you are listening to us live, please remember there's a chat function. All you have to do, if you're using the Spreaker app, hit the little chat icon, chat icon, and say hello, tell me where you're listening from, ask any questions, share any thoughts or concerns. It will show up right here on my computer screen that is to my left, and I will either address the issue that you bring up or answer the question live on the air. Uh, sometimes I'll, 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 uh, I'll lean over and uh, you know type out some kind of a response, but if you're listening to us live, you can always engage with us that way. It's super easy. It's a it's a great tool, and we uh, we we haven't really used it a lot, um, but it's there, and we want people to always be aware that you're. That's how easy it is to contact me, right? When I'm live on the air, you can literally jump in and share your thoughts, your concerns, whatever questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Again, if you're using the Spreaker app, just hit the little chat icon and say whatever you want. Just say hello. And um, I just want everyone to know that's there. Now, if you don't listen to us live, well, you can always contact me by email at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. And I'm going to stress that because it seems that a lot of people on YouTube, they uh, a lot of them love to do the little drive-by, throw out some kind of negative comment, and then keep going. And they don't really want to engage in an actual meaningful conversation. If you would like to actually have a meaningful conversation, you can email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. It's been the same email address address for what, 15 years, 20 years? It's been literally the same email address for almost forever. Uh, so I always find it interesting when you find people talking about me <laughs> on the internet instead of just emailing me because it's literally been the same email address. But that's 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 neither here nor there. All right. Now it is Wednesday, and we're still trying to figure out what the new normal looks like because we've returned to a normal in-person service schedule. Right. We now actually have people here for our services. If you don't know, our church services are 10 a.m. for Sunday school on Sunday mornings, 11 is worship, then at 6 p.m. is Sunday night, and then Wednesday at 7 p.m. is our midweek service. Now, what was happening you know, during the COVID situation is obviously we weren't having in-person services, so I was just getting to the church you know, whenever and just doing hour after hour after hour of live broadcasting, hour after hour after hour. So on Wednesdays, sometimes I would show up or, you know, one, two in the afternoon and just one hour after another hour, and then just stop whenever I was ready to stop. Now that, you know, I have to be here at 7 p.m., I've got to figure out how I'm going to work, you know, work this schedule out on Sundays. You know, I was here hour after hour. I was get, I would get here like at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Uh, so some of those things are going to change. So we're going to try to work out how things are going to work moving forward. Um, it may limit the amount of hours I have to do a uh, special live episodes, but we will, I will ensure that I find a way to continue to bring you as much content as I can that hopefully will be beneficial, helpful, and challenging, and informative. And that's what I hope to do right here in this episode. I want to inform you once again about a podcast that you need to be subscribed to, a podcast that you should be listening to, and I have to thank one of our I have to thank one of our listeners who uh, brought this information to me and reminded me that season two of this podcast has just begun. And again, I I have to thank the listeners. You guys are you can be my eyes and ears. You can let me know. Hey, this is interesting. Hey, you should watch this. You should review this. What about this? Uh, I cannot watch and keep up with everything. So the more. You know, I'll refer to them as super listeners, the one who con the, those who contact me, listen to every episode, share episodes, are really engaged with the program and send me lots of content. Sometimes you guys do the show prep. All I have to do is open my email inbox and there's my show prep. 
There it is. It's all laid out for me. <laughs> here's episode one. Here's episode two. Here's episode three. Here's 10 episodes I could do today. And sometimes I don't have to even do anything other than take your email. Sometimes I have to do additional research. But in many cases, you guys do 90% of the research. It's all right there in one email, all everything, all the links I need, all the information I need. And that makes it super easy. So today, what we're going to do is I'm going to remind you again of an episode of a podcast that I, I really I'm begging you go subscribe to today, please. We're going to listen to a little bit of one of the episodes from season two. And uh, just I'm just going to give you some basic background. So it's pretty straightforward for this first live broadcast of this Wednesday, March the 10th. Pretty straightforward. This is going to be about information. And uh, hopefully you will listen to me. And you will start listening to this podcast, and then you'll start emailing me your thoughts about each episode. All right, here we go. The name of the podcast is Heaven Bent. Heaven Bent. It should be available anywhere you get your podcast. If you use a podcast app and you cannot find it, let me know, and I'll I'll try to tell you, you know, where you can listen. I know that there are at least three places you can listen to it right now. Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Google Podcast. I know it's available on all three of those right now. So again, Heaven Bent, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast. I'm, I'm, I, I can almost guarantee it's going to be everywhere. But go find it right now. Right now. I'm going to sit here and wait. Go find it right now and hit subscribe. Right now. I'm waiting. I'm going to sit here and wait. Come on. I, I, I'm looking at you. I'm, I'm watching you right now. Come on. Pull the car over, pull the car over. I know you're driving. Pull the car over and go look up the Heaven Bent podcast and subscribe to it, all right? Here's the basic information. As um, published on uh, on the website for the Heaven Bent uh, podcast, all right? Here we go. This is their information, their description. Heaven Bent, Tara Jean Stevens was a teenager when a bizarre spiritual movement spread to her childhood church in Prince Rupert, British Columbia. Worshippers were laughing uncontrollably, shaking and falling to the ground. Some even claimed that gold teeth miraculously appeared in their mouths. In season one, join Tara Jean as she begins her exploration of the Toronto blessing. In season two... That's the season now. She tracks the spread of this movement to Bethel Church in Redding, California today. Or in, in, in Redding, California. All right, I'll stop right there. Now, you've, you've had have heard of Bethel Church. You've had to he- heard of Beth- Bethel Church. Bethel Church is one of the most influential churches in the United States of America. We've reviewed some sermons from Bethel Church. We've done podcast episodes when Bethel Church found themselves in different situations. We have talked about them. And I, and I know, listen, you say, well, I don't care about Bethel Church. I don't care what's going on in a lot of these big churches. You have to care because these influential churches inf- influence Christianity. And if you claim to be a Christian, you're now a part of Christianity that is being influenced by these big churches that, that come from a specific theological stream. If you're not aware of it, if you're not aware of its influence, then you may be influenced by it without even realizing it. You won't see its influence unless you spend some time making yourself familiar with it so that you can identify its influence, that you can speak against it, that you can not only defend it, not only defend true Christianity from these problematic streams of Christianity, these corrupt streams of Christianity. Not only can you defend true Christianity, but you can, uh, listen, not only protect yourself, but you can help protect others. When you hear other people start talking and go, oh, okay, they're being influenced by this. They're being influenced by that. But you have to be knowledgeable. You have to be aware of what's going on in Christianity. And I've stated it so many times. It's very easy to be informed. It's very easy to see what's going on within Christianity. It's called a mobile device or an iPad, all right, a tablet or phone. All you need to do is start looking up all, maybe just start looking all the churches in your local area and just start listening to sermons, going from church to church to church. That will give you what's happening in your local area. Then you can just start looking for churches in your state and just go from church Church website to church website, uh, you know, church app from church app, and just start listening, downloading sermons, listening, 
And you'll start, at times you'll notice kind of a trend. You'll notice maybe they're mentioning a book or they're mentioning something or, or there's a certain, you know, philological perspective that you keep hearing over and over and you can kind of get an idea of where things are going. And then you, then you're knowledgeable and knowledge equals protection. Ignorance puts you in a very vulnerable state spiritually. That's why we were doing a mini series on the subject of ignorance, right? That's why I was trying to get you to think about that. This is a, a perfect example. Here's a podcast that will give you information not only about a, a history of a, a certain, I'll call it a theological stream, I'll call it a very polluted, corrupt theological stream, but it'll give you a little bit of history of that and then lead you right up to today where there's a very influential church. So why would you not take the time to subscribe to this pod, to this podcast, Heaven Bent, and start learning and listening and understanding what occurred? doesn't mean you have to agree with everything in the podcast, but it means you're at least getting information and you can do your own research. And you know my perspective. Look, I've, if I've said it once, I've said it a, a million times. I believe charismatic theology is a corrupt theology. I think Charismatic theology is a poison. It's a cancer to historical biblical Christianity. And too many Christians have sat back and just tried to, you know, not, you know, we don't want to rock any boats. We don't want any conflict. We'll just go along to get along. And no, we should have, we should have stood strong against charismatic theology and not allow it to infiltrate and corrupt so much of Christianity. And this podcast is tracing at least one stream of this kind of theology. Let me go back and read this all again. Tara Jean Stevens was a teenager when a bizarre spiritual movement spread to her childhood church in Prince Rupert, British Columbia. Worshippers were laughing uncontrollably, shaking and falling to the ground. Some even claimed that gold teeth miraculously appeared in their mouths. And season one joined Tara Jean as she begins her exploration of the Toronto Blessing, and that season is complete, but you can go back and listen to all of it by subscribing to the podcast. In season two, she tracks the spread of this movement to Bethel Church in Redding, California. Today, Bethel is one of the largest and most unusual churches in America. What goes on inside its bewildering school of supernatural ministry? Is Bethel, is Bethel as powerful as its critics believe it to be? And during the COVID-19 pandemic, why are its most high-profile leaders defying public health orders? Heaven bent, an examination of divine intervention. Again, Heaven Bent is the name of the podcast. Please go find it. Please subscribe to it right now. And by all means, if you're listening, even if you go back and start with season one, if you start listening, let me know, hey, this episode they started talking about this, you know, it was like at the four minute mark. Could you, could you, you know, review that segment? Could you give me more information? Could you help me understand? Just tell me what you want me to talk about and we will review it, talk about it, analyze it, and maybe turn into a, a completely study, uh, you know, a study on our own to follow whatever you want me to follow and whatever you want to talk about. I'm here to try to help you out, but I think you need to hear this. This is someone who witnessed a lot of this. This is someone who was, who, who was at least connected to a lot of those things that took place. Look, I've been speaking, I was speaking against the Toronto blessing way back. I've, I've, I've been speaking against charismatic theology pretty much my whole Christian life. It, it did not take me very long um, in my Christian life to start going this charismatic theology. I, I no. There, there's major problems. And the more I would get exposed to it, even in just little bits, just just in little, little just working with people who were charismatic in their theology, just, just the little bits that I was exposed to, it became obvious to me, this, this is abhorrent. This is, this is crazy. And then when you start studying the history of it, and then, you know, a lot of different, a lot of research started coming out. A lot of books started being written about charismatic theology. And I just became this, no, absolutely not, absolutely not, absolutely not, absolutely not. And here we are in 2021. And well, now we have a podcast with someone who was, who, who was there as a teenager, witnessed some of this, and you can listen to her perspective. And again, take what she says and do your own research. Do your own research. And, and because I'm telling you, um, yeah, there's, there's so much I could, I could go into in, in, in regards to it. But this is what we're going to do. I have episode two of season two queued up. 
episode one kind of, I mean, there's probably a lot there we could listen to. I think I have it downloaded, but, um, but it kind of deals a little bit with the, the whole COVID situation and what, how Bethel handled it. And we've talked about the COVID situation so many times that I felt like, I felt like that in many cases we would be covering ground that we've already covered so, spent so many hours on. So I thought I would jump over to uh, season two, episode two, um, and uh, we'll just, we'll listen to a little bit of it. I'll throw in a few thoughts, more just as a preview to try to motivate you to go subscribe to the Heaven Bent podcast. It's it's very easy to do. You look it up in your podcast uh, app and you hit subscribe and then you start listening, All right? So here we go. Let's listen to a little bit of episode two, season two of the Heaven Bent podcast. You see how I keep repeating it over and over and over and over and over again? Yeah, because I'm still waiting for you to go do that and I'm watching you and you're not doing it. Go do it. All right, here we go. It's interesting because really in Reading, it's sort of a tale of two markets. You know, there's there's everyone within the Bethel bubble who tends to go to their own coffee shop and to attend, you know, their own um, Saturday outdoor market. You can go to a Saturday outdoor market and you literally will only see people in their hipster clothing, you know, set worship music playing in the background from a live band. You go down the street to another market it's a completely different crowd. It's the local Reading crowd. There's no worship music. There's no hipster clothes. There's just fresh fruits and vegetables. So it's it's sort of like there's actually two alternate markets happening. And this is one of the things that people are concerned about. That yes, Bethel is bringing in new life and new blood and, and new dollars. But how many of those dollars are actually just circulating within members of the church? This is Heaven Bent. I'm Tara Jean Stevens. Episode 2, The City of Reading. As I settle into this exploration of Bethel Church in Reading, California, what I'm quickly realizing is that as much as this season is about a church and its people, it's also about the growing influence and impact that this church has on the city itself. So on this episode... As we dig a little deeper into Bethel's practices and core beliefs, we'll also get a real vibe for the town it's such a huge part of. First up, I want to welcome back Annalise Pierce, our investigative journalist who lives in Reading. She describes it as a small interstate town about an hour south of Oregon. It's often thought of as the Bible Belt of California. Um, it, Reading's about 90,000 people, um, a highly conservative, um, low-income area. Really genuine, kind people here, but yeah, very, very conservative and very, uh, most people who have lived here have lived here for a long time. If it wasn't for the pandemic, I would have totally made a road trip to Reading myself. From my home in Vancouver, without traffic or stopping, it's about a 12-hour drive. I could have interviewed people face-to-face. I could have witnessed for myself what it's like to be in a Bethel service. Bethel is a very experiential church to attend or be a part of. Um, I sometimes refer to Bethel as the Disneyland of Christian evangelicalism. It's a church where when you go, um, very few things are off limits when it comes to how you express worship or experience God. Um, The services are filled with people who are in their upper teens and 20s who are experiencing God in really wild ways. Um, Kind of reminds you of a rock concert a lot of times. The music's loud, the lights are dim. There's laughing and crying and people rolling around on the floors. It's a very safe space for people who want to just experience God without limits and without boundaries, as I think a lot of young people do. According to Annalise, Not everyone, but lots of people in the community find Bethel attendees and its students to be really kind and well-intentioned individuals. When you meet them in public, they're kind of recognizable for their hipster clothes and their bright smiles. 
And there's quite a lot of talk in the community that these people have all drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, why are they so happy? And wh why did they come here to pay for the, the privilege of attending this church? There's a lot of confusion about why anyone would feel that this is something worthwhile paying for. Reading isn't really a, a well-known destination in California. It's you know extremely hot in the summers. It's a small interstate town with, yes, a lot of beauty around it. But a lot of people feel that, that the amount of influence that Bill Johnson and Chris Ballatin have over these students and attenders is really unusual and strange. Um, almost anything that Bill or Chris does can be found repeated frequently or quoted frequently by these students. And, and it almost doesn't matter how strange it is, it seems to be picked up. Chris Vallotton. That's Bethel leader Bill Johnson's right-hand man. The two families, so the Johnsons and the Vallottons, actually started out as neighbors in a nearby mountain town called Weaverville. It's about an hour outside Reading. Before they all transferred to Bethel in 1996-97, they pastored in Weaverville together for around 17 years. Today, along with some of their grown children, they lead Bethel's local community of more than 11,000 worshipers who, quote, exist to ignite individual hearts until heaven meets earth. I want to say that again for any of you who aren't familiar with this kind of language. They are a community of worshipers who exist to ignite individual hearts until heaven meets earth. But what does that even mean? It's a statement I've ripped right off the Bethel website. And from what sense I've made of it so far, it links directly back to Bethel's core belief. And I'm ultra simplifying it here, but it's called kingdom theology. And this is the belief that Christians have the natural ability to manifest the kingdom of God here on earth. And the more Christians worship and practice the gifts of the spirit, so speaking in tongues, healing the sick, prophesying, the more they do all these things, the fuller God's kingdom will become. And when God's kingdom comes into absolute fullness, that's when they say Jesus will return to earth and take all the Christians, living and dead, up to heaven. At Bethel, they believe this is what we were created for, to manifest the kingdom of God here on earth. And the sooner, the better. That's why, and I've definitely noted this, there is a concerted effort in the greater Bethel community, but especially from students of Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, which is also known as BSSM, it's this concerted effort to spread this information, this kingdom theology, to as many people who are willing to hear it. It's called witnessing. In general, it is quite common to be approached by members of BSSM asking to pray for you. Um, and many people really dislike it, um, particularly this, the disabled community. Many people in wheelchairs or with issues with walking are approached very repeatedly, sometimes multiple times in a week especially during the beginning of the BSSM school year when there's many new students here with a lot of zeal and fervor. There's a lot of online chatter from local business owners about their customers complaining that Bethel students are bothering them while they're trying to shop, buy a dress, fill a prescription, or whatever. Many of these businesses have actually put up signs that state no religious solicitation. But despite their behavior being incredibly polarizing in the community and especially offensive amongst many locals in the disabled community, people who honestly say they don't want to be healed, Bethel presses on, even coming up with a sort of game to make witnessing more fun. It's a, essentially a prophetic exercise where you turn your attention to God and ask God for some clues for the treasure that you're going to find somebody that he cares about that's part of his kingdom that he wants to deliver a special message to. And they're, they're the treasure you're hunting for. Basically, from what it sounds like, a group of students or just regular Bethel folk, they gather around before they go out and collectively they use their gut or their spiritual gut or their imagination, whatever you want to call it, and they come up with a whole bunch of clues. Clues that they believe will lead them out into the community to find a stranger who needs a healing, or maybe some kind of encouraging word. After you get these clues, which, which might be things like red sweatshirt, or blonde hair, or looks afraid, or Arby's, 
after you get these clues, then you drive to whatever location you feel directed to by the Holy Spirit, whether that's just driving around in town or going straight to Arby's if you got that that specific word. Once you get there, you you know look around the crowd and if you see someone wearing a red sweatshirt with blonde hair who looks scared, you're you're gold. You've got all your clues right there. You go straight to that person and and ask God what do they want to tell that person? Asking if you can give them a message from God that they're God's treasure tonight. And All right, there's so much here to take apart. There's so much here to take apart, but uh obviously there's you get the two very fundamental charismatic teachings that is evident through charismatic churches everywhere. And there's two basic ideas. Number one, God is continuing to reveal himself, continuing to speak to us outside of scripture. Script, it's not scripture alone, even though they may want to claim that it's not scripture alone. God is speaking outside of the Bible, which ultimately then makes the Bible irrelevant. I know charismatics get mad when I say that, but I don't care if God is speaking to me outside of the Bible. If God is speaking to me right now, telling me this and telling me that and telling me what to say to this person and give me a message here, give me a message there, telling me about this and telling me about that, why am I going to sit down and spend hour after hour studying you know, books written over a thousand years ago, um, sitting there trying to understand the Greek, the Hebrew, syntax, understanding the depth meaning of words, context, historical context, cultural context, you know, uh, understanding grammar and trying to, to exegete a text to figure it out. Why do I do all of that when God is just going to tell me anything? He's not, he's going to tell me who I need to go talk to, give me and, and give you clues. I don't, I don't know why he would just give you, why is he giving you clues? Why wouldn't he just give you their name? Like, why won't he just give you their address? Why would he give you clues to go on a, 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 a spiritual hunt? But that's okay. But the point is we could, we could go all day on, on that, but all right. Um, a, tr- a spiritual treasure hunt. Again, you just think, why wouldn't God just give you their specific name and address? And you could just go there and say, hey, God told me to tell you this, but he sends you on a spiritual treasure hunt by giving you clues. You figure out the clues, you find the person, and then you say, okay, I've got a message to you from God. And then God tells you what to say. I mean, at that point, I mean, scripture becomes irrelevant. I mean, uh, scripture becomes irrelevant, but that's, that's a continue. I mean, that's a common teaching within the charismatic world of this idea that God speaks to you. He, he tells you this, he tells you that, he tells you this, he tells you that. And you see the influence of charismatic theology, even in churches that don't really identify themselves as charismatic. It's still common for the pastor to be standing behind the pulpit saying, God told me this, you know, I was going to do this and God told me this. And again, if you're writing that down, The minute they say, God told me this, and then they tell you what God said, that would be open quotation, close quotation. You are supposedly quoting the very words of God. If you are, if you're quoting the exact words of God, then that's on the same level as Scripture. If you say God told me something and then you tell me what he said and you're, therefore you're quoting God, that's literally on the same level of scripture. So you need to be writing it and putting it in your Bible. And if you go, if you listen to charismatic church after charismatic church after charismatic church, uh, one time I did this, I spent like a month doing it and it was just ridiculous. I, 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 t- I had a notebook. And I'm like, okay, God's words uh, in charismatic churches. I, I don't remember what I called it. And then I just said, just went from sermon after sermon of charismatic churches. And every time they would say God said, then I would, you know, quotations. And then I just had a, a notebook filled with supposedly quotations from God, quotations from God. And it was just so ridiculous, the things supposedly God was saying. And in some cases, you would listen to one charismatic church. God was saying this. You would listen to another charismatic church. And you're like, God was saying this. You're like, well, wait a minute. These two things don't even really work. They seem to contradict one another. But God is supposedly saying both of them. And by the time I got done with a month of doing this, I basically reached the point that any reasonable person trying to figure out what God is saying, you're going to be, it's so convoluted and so confusing because God is telling every, at each church, God is telling them something specifically different than what he's telling another church, but supposedly it's the same God speaking. And if you don't see how that just leads to utter complete confusion and chaos. Now it works. If all you do is listen to what God is telling your pastor, supposedly, or what he's supposedly telling you. But if you go listen to the broader charismatic community, the, the broader charismatic church 
across the United States or even globally, you're going to be hearing, wait, well, God told them that. Well, God told them that. Well, God told God told me that uh, here in the local area, um, some some big things were supposed to get ready to happen here to the city of Abilene, Texas. Um, I don't remember all the details, but they were very specific because this, this God spoke to him in a vision and all of these things were going to happen to Abilene, Texas. Well, not one of those things happened. Not one of them. It was it was a straight up lie. God was not speaking to them. They it was they made it up and over and over. And how many times God was telling supposed charismatic leaders that Trump was going to be reelected. God told charismatic leaders time and time again these things and they say them and they don't come to pass because God only speaks to us in Scripture alone. So you hear a little bit of that right right, right there at Bethel Church. That's, that's a key belief because that's that's just key in charismatic churches across the United States and America, across the world. It's a part of that charismatic theological stream. Another one is God guarantees healing right now, right here, right now. God guarantees healing. And if by faith you will believe, you can be healed. So, of course, they're going to run around you know, trying to heal people who are disabled. Of course, they're going to try to do that because they believe healing is guaranteed. And no matter how many times no healing takes place, no matter how many times it doesn't manifest itself, then the person who doesn't get healed usually is the one blamed. Because they did not have enough faith. Uh, but, but I'm telling you, healing, <laughs> look, uh, I, I hate even having to say this, but healing is not guaranteed for, for us right now. It's obvious. Just look around you. Children dying of cancer, hospitals filled, people die, people get sick, even in charismatic churches. Again, I'll get, I'll get emails from some charismatic wanting to argue with me. I worked 22 years in the medical world. And all of these people who were in some big charismatic church on a Sunday night, I would listen to this, their sermons on a Sunday night claiming God was doing this healing. God was healing. God is healing this person. And they were you know, all going you know, full charismatic and emotional and yelling and all that stuff. And then Monday morning, I'd be getting a phone call from people from that very church trying to get a medical appointment. And I wanted to say, wait a minute. Last night, supposedly everybody was being healed. What? Just go to your church and get healed. Why are you calling us? Why are you going to take up a medical appointment? Why? Because it was all a lie. No, it, it, it's all just, it's just, it's, it's show, it's fake, it's fraudulent, it's corrupt. And Bethel, you see both of those ideas right there in what we've just heard. The healing concept and the God still speaking concept. It's true in every charismatic church. It's the same thing over and over and over again. And no matter how many times healings don't occur, how many times they claim God told them something that obviously doesn't come to pass or doesn't happen, no matter how many times they are exposed as not telling the truth and that what their claims are fraudulent, doesn't stop. They just continue on and continue on and continue on, which is disheartening, discouraging, and it is sad but here's what, what, what drives me so, what makes me so upset about the charismatic world is they don't ever seem to care about all the damage they have done and lives they have destroyed. All right, let's listen to a little bit more. That, that you want to give them a message directly from God for their heart. Treasure hunting, I believe, was originally developed by Kevin Zedman. Okay. Ready? Ready, set, go. Okay, well, my name is Kevin Dedlin, and I've been in ministry since 1981. I've planted churches, pastored churches. Kevin Dedman is my next guest. He's been a Bethel member for more than 18 years, and he's a former teacher at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. And of course, I created the Treasure Hunt and the Treasure Hunt book, and the whole strategy in about 2003. Kevin tells me that God gave him the initial idea for treasure hunting to help take away some of that awkwardness that comes from repeatedly approaching strangers out in public, like they do at Bethel. Man, I just, there was something in me that just felt like we're always like trying to push things on people and bugging people who don't really want to be bugged. And I thought, this is just, it just feels awkward. So I said, Lord, I don't really feel like even witnessing anymore because it feels so awkward and embarrassing. And it feels embarrassing for the people like we're invading their space all the time. 
And it's just not fun. Like the people who are coming out with us, they they make up excuses like, oh, I've got to go to the dentist. It's like they scheduled a dental appointment instead of going out street witnessing or going door to door. It was so painful for them. They'd rather, you know, go to a dentist and get their teeth done without any Novocaine or anything, I guess. Treasure hunting basically starts with a treasure map, which is really just a piece of paper. But on it, there's a grid with five different categories of clues to fill in before you head out. One would be a location. Another would be a person's name. And then what they might be wearing, what they need uh, healing for or a miracle for or prayer for, and then something unusual. So there were five categories. And in each one of those categories, I'd have six spaces. So you'd have six locations, six names, uh, six articles of clothing, Um, You know, and it could even be like a tattoo or earrings or butterfly glasses, anything like that. And then uh, what they need prayer for and then anything unusual like a tire, flat tire or ice cream cone or pizza, something like that. Treasure hunts are now done by Christians all over the world. And many of them have been documented and posted to YouTube. You want to tell one or two? Um, We were looking for, on our sheet, we got somebody uh, with, that was Harry. Like, I had a lot of hair. Not the name Harry. And then we also uh, wrote down Elbow. And so I saw this guy by the bathroom there, and uh, he had a lot of hair. And so I went over there and said, hey, can you help me out? Um, I was praying this morning. I feel like, you know, we wrote down some stuff. I'm looking for somebody who has a problem with their elbows. And I don't know why I said this, but I just said, hey, uh, how's your elbow? And he kind of gave me the funny look. Um, This week, I banged my elbow into a door, and I think I sprained it. For the most part, the treasure hunts, the ones that are shared online anyway, they result in some kind of positive and meaningful interaction with a stranger. But I'm going to take a flying stab that not all treasure hunts pan out that way, right? I'm sure there's plenty of ditched footage of strangers that get rubbed the wrong way about being approached like that. I bet there's also countless times where the clues on their treasure map just didn't connect. And then what? You know, I've had words of knowledge for people where said, hey, do you have a problem with your left shoulder? And they're like, no, but I have a problem with my right shoulder. And they ended up getting healed because I said, I could take care of that. And so what we teach people is to relax, rest in who they are. And then, yes, certainly grow in competency. And some people are more extroverted than others. But, you know, for the introverts, I say, just go find one treasure and hang out with that one treasure for 45 minutes or an hour. And the extroverts are going to basically go and find 10 different treasures. Kevin says that receiving a prophetic word from a stranger like this, maybe receiving a healing to boot, these things, he says, make it much easier to convince people on the streets of Reading or wherever that what they believe at Bethel is real and true. He also said that during his 13 years as a teacher, he saw treasure hunting result in countless locals being brought into the church. I'll never forget. All right. Now this, this is also, there's a full, so we, so if we kind of break this down, we're seeing some basic concepts of charismatic theology being played out, right? We've got the idea that God is speaking outside of the Bible. We got the idea that healing is somehow guaranteed. You heard how he said that I can take care of that. Oh, your other shoulders hurt. I can take care of that. I can heal you. Now, Again, as someone who worked in the medical world for 22 years, that drives me absolutely insane because when you're working in a hospital and people are getting sick, people are dying, they're getting diagnosis of terminal cancer or whatever the case may be, or in many cases, I was responsible in many cases of taking the people who died, uh, taking their belongings, preparing the body, taking it down to the morgue. Maybe even be a part of watching or assisting in the uh, if they, if they had to do any kind of autopsy or uh, organ donation. Um, I, I I was there for uh, many of those, uh, filling out the death certificate. A lot of things that I had to do in the medical world. Um, where were where were the charismatics there? Where where were they? 
Where were they? To to heal someone's child who just died or or someone's husband who just died. Or, or I remember one horrible night where uh, a, a family's father um, had a heart attack and died. It was, I think it was Christmas night or the night before. It was either Christmas Eve or Christmas night. And I was had to sit there with the family to fill out the death certificate. You talk about horrible, horrible, horrible. Where were the charismatics? Where were the charismatics to heal any of those people? Where were they? They're never there. They're never there. Oh, they're on their podcast or on their television shows claiming people are being healed, but they're never there in the medical world healing anyone. They're not. Cemeteries. Where? How come there's so many cemeteries? Go there and raise them all up from the dead. Do something. Why are there children right now dying of cancer? Go heal them. I get so tired of the charismatic world. So we've seen that that God continues to speak. All right, we, we see that uh, and healing is guaranteed. I, just whenever I start talking about healing, I'm sorry. I just get so, oh, I get so frustrated with it because it's just so evil to make claims that anyone who, who I mean, it's just, they're just fraudulent claims. But there's another kind of idea there. It was a little subtle. I don't know if you picked it up, but it was there. And the idea goes something like this. If we go out and we heal people, if we go out and show them that God spoke to us, in other words, if we do some miraculous signs, that will lead people to believe in Christ. That will lead people to believe. Let me make it very clear. No one is converted by simply seeing supernatural work. Conversion is not a work done by external miracles. Uh, Salvation occurs by an internal miracle of the word of God and the Holy Spirit. It's something that happens inside of people. You can see miracle after miracle after miracle and not truly be converted. Oh, you may want to turn to God so that you can get some of those benefits or some of that power, but that's not conversion. Conversion is a supernatural work done inside of a person utilizing the word of God and the spirit of God regenerates that person brings them from spiritual death to spiritual life. A spiritually dead person simply seeing miracles cannot convert them. Israel saw miracle after miracle after miracle and still turned to idolatry, still demonstrated a lack of trust in God, still demonstrated in many cases a complete lack of belief in God. People saw the miracles of Jesus, right? They saw, the multitude saw the miracles of Jesus and ultimately they turned away from him. Ultimately, they were shouting crucify him because external miracles do not bring true conversion. They turn people to the miracle, to the power, but not necessarily to God. And make sure you understand just because miracles occur, that is not proof that something is from God. Read the book of Revelation. People will be deceived in the the book of Revelation, speaking of the world being deceived through signs and wonders. Signs and wonders just draws people to the signs and wonders. It doesn't lead to true spiritual conversion. People are saved through the proclamation, the preaching of God's word. And then the spirit of uh, the spirit of God has to utilizing the word of God, those work together to bring, to bring a new birth, to bring salvation. It's it's this idea that if people see miracles, then they'll get saved. No, they'll get attracted to the miracles. They'll be drawn to the miracles. That's not going to bring salvation. Again, just read the, the Old Testament Israel, miracle after miracle after, I mean, how many miracles could you how many miracles do you need to see? And next thing you know, oh, we don't trust God. Nope, we don't believe in God. Nope, we're going to turn to idolatry because it doesn't change the heart. Miracles don't change the heart. It's the word of God and conversion, regeneration. And that is a supernatural work God does inside of you. And it's not accomplished through you seeing external miracles. It is accomplished through the preaching of his word. It's the proclamation of God's word. That is what's required for salvation. The proclamation of God's word and then the spirit of God. And then we could get into a whole theological discussion about the order of salvation. And we could, we could talk about regeneration, faith, repentance, and how this all works. But the spirit of God is actively involved with the word of God to bring that person. He has to get, bring spiritual life, a new birth. And just a dead person seeing miracles, it's not going to change anything. 
So that, that's another part of their th- theological belief system, right? So we got three aspects to the charismatic theology kind of being outlined here, right? Now, we're already gone longer than I wanted to here, but that's okay. I just, I'm trying to do everything I can to get you to subscribe to this podcast so that you can listen to everything that, that, I mean, she does a great job going into a lot of these elements, but I'm just breaking them down for you. So you see some of the basic elements of charismatic theology here. God speaks to people outside of the Bible. Healing is guaranteed for the here and now, and that miracles produ- well is, can produce salvation, basically. All right, They may not state it exactly that directly, but ultimately, when you break it down, that's part of their theology. If people see miracles, they will get converted. And I'm arguing biblically that is not the case. They need to be, pre- the word of God must be preached. The word of God must be preached. All right, let's continue. Forget one lady, she was getting baptized and she was sharing her testimony to the thousand people who were there. And, and uh, she said, well, I got saved because I was found by treasure hunters four times. And by, on the fifth time I was found, I couldn't resist any longer. And I received Jesus. And now I've been walking with him for three months. And now I'm here tonight to be baptized. And she was about 60 years old. She said that after the second time, she actually changed her schedule to to go out on Thursday afternoons when she knew the treasure hunters were out in the city, just hoping she'd get found again and wanting to be convinced. So that's pretty cool. In Reading, people in the Bethel community make up more than 10% of the city population. This has not only given them a palpable presence around town, it's also given them a powerful sway in civic elections. And Bethel's influence in local government is a growing concern for lots of residents. I'd like to move item 9A, which is to accept the donation of $25,000 from Bethel Church to um, follow this item. This recording is from a Reading City Council meeting back in December 2017. The matter at hand was whether or not to accept $25,000 from Bethel for a brand new pair of police drones. Council, I'm going to recuse myself from that okay. vote. That's Julie Winter excusing herself from the vote. She was elected as a city council member a few years prior to this and more recently ended her time as mayor. In Reading, mayor is a rotating position. And she recuses herself from every council matter that involves Bethel because she's an elder in the church and one of the main people that Bethel critics are concerned about. The first speaker is Chris Vallotton. <coughs> That's the Chris Vallotton, Bethel's associate pastor, Bill Johnson's right-hand man. Well, good evening and Merry Christmas. Um, I'm, Bethel, I'm Chris Vallotton from Bethel Church. I'm not Bethel Church, but <laughs> obviously. Um, you- Chris is also a co-founder of Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. And he's considered by the church and by many of his international followers to be a prophet of God. The biggest prophecy that he's got on the table right now is that Trump will win a second term in the upcoming 2020 presidential election. Um, we uh, know that Bethel Church is very concerned about our city. And um, we've, spent, um, we've raised about, you know, we've, we've agreed to raise $1.2 million to help with the, keep the MPU officers. So... We're very concerned about how effective our police officers are, and we know that they're undermanned. So we had a conversation with the chief of police um, probably about three months ago, and just talking about how can we help further. And we were talking about the MPU project, and is there any other way we could help further? And he brought me back a budget of $25,000 to both buy the uh, UAVs and also train the officers, and we decided that we would fund them. That's the whole story. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your offer. Chris paints a really simple picture of a church with a big heart and deep pockets. And it is, no doubt. In 2018, and this is just one of many examples of Bethel's generosity and heart, Bethel offered $1,000 to every family who had lost their home during Shasta County's devastating car wildfire, which at the time was the sixth most destructive wildfire in state history. But as I've mentioned, not everyone in Reading sees Bethel as this benevolent provider. 
All right. Hello. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is David Robbins, um, longtime resident of Reading and Shasta County. Um, I had a couple concerns over the um, the drone program, the gifting um, by Bethel Church. Um, uh, what comes to mind is violation of separation of church and state. I know that particularly in our town, the line between that has been blurry um, over the past couple decades, and um, I'm not alone in my concerns about that. The council also heard from a man named Nicholas Gilliam. Can I get this stool? All right. um, Along with uh, David, I'm another uh, concerned uh, lifelong resident of Shasta County. Uh, I'm very concerned about the uh, Bethel Church's funding of this project. It seems like a warning sign that the city's priorities are lying more in uh, sweeping our most vulnerable people under the rug so that uh, out-of-town worshipers won't be bothered by the consequences of failed and failing systems. Um, I feel like... Uh, Nicholas Gilliam shared his belief that Bethel has an alternative motive for wanting to clean up the city. He says it's really about making Reading more appealing to all of its international guests, which, up until COVID, there were more than 50,000 of every year. And he fears that the drones could be used to do things like unfairly target the homeless by finding illegal campsites, many of them in the nearby Shasta County wilderness. And we will not conduct random surveillance activities. That's Redding's chief of police at the time, Roger Moore, attempting to squash any concerns ahead of the council vote. We're to target persons based solely on individual characteristics, such as but not limited to race, ethnicity, national origin, religious affiliation, disability, gender, or sexual orientation. And again, I want to emphasize these UAVs will not be weaponized. Are there any questions? Do you have a question? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Chief. Um, a few things I want there was to- one brief question from a council member about beefing up the I privacy the policy, iPads but overall, he was very much in favor of Bethel's drone donation. And moments later, the council quickly voted to accept. And so I appreciate, uh, like, again, the offer, and I agree with my fellow council members. I'll support the motion. So I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And no opposed. Motion passes, and thank you very much. In a more recent civic election, Bethel's Julie Winter was nearly joined on council by someone else from Bethel who ran for office. With more insight, here again is Annalise Pierce. And both of them got extraordinarily high amounts of votes based on one of them with with almost no publicity, with almost no, you know, he wasn't known in the community at all and very little signage, et cetera. So again, no evidence, but this feeling that there are enough people behind anyone who runs for council at Bethel, with 11,000 attenders locally, there's enough people that would vote for that that they could get it through. And then once they get those people into power, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter if somebody is directly handing them a favor for money. They still have people in power who, um, who will champion their viewpoints and their ideas. Yeah, I don't... Hmm. It would be... I'd be interesting to see how many people, if you... What you feel about that? Uh, I mean, clearly a church that big with that many people in a city of only 90,000, that church is going to become the dominant influencer. Is that a good way of saying it? They're going to have power. They're going to have influence. Is that bad? Is that good? Do you do you want to assign that they have some wrong motive? You, are you going to say that their motives are good, but that with that much power comes a possible problem? Problem, especially, you know, how much power should a church have? What what you know? There, there uh, there's a lot of. In other words, you could do a lot of speculating and a lot of guessing, and I don't want to. I don't want to do that. It it does seem possibly problematic. It would be interested. I'd be interested to get everyone else's uh, um, everyone else's thoughts. Yes, good morning, uh, Colton. Good morning. Um, Colton is uh, saying hello this morning, so I always appreciate that. Uh, so I, I don't know what to make of that. It, I, I, 
I don't. I, it's hard for me to try to criticize that. I think it's the. I think it's a natural thing. If you have a church that big, with that much money, being able to you know offer twenty five thousand dollars for the police force to have drones, um, I think it's just inevitable that they're going to be the ones that's going to influence and they're going to drive a lot of the direction of that local community. And people who don't like that are not going to like that. If the church is not the one doing the influence, it could be an individual with lots of money. So I, I don't want to criticize that. I just, I, I can see why if you're not a Christian, if you're not a part of Bethel, you may be like, what, what is going on here? Is this, is, is Bethel church becoming in a sense, the city church influencing the direction of the city and even influencing policy that that could be a problem, but all right, we'll, we'll continue. We're almost done. We'll just, I I didn't intend for this, uh, for the, for it to go this long, but that's okay. Um, if I can get people to, you know, open up their, their, uh, podcast app, their podcast platform of choice and subscribe to the heaven bent podcast, then I am, then I've accomplished something. So Hopefully you will do that. Again, for those who may just be tuning in, we are listening to um, episode two of season two of the Heaven Bent podcast, which I would strongly recommend everyone to subscribe to. Uh, it Right now uh, for season two, they are focusing in on Bethel Church in Redding, California. And uh, we are listening a li- little bit to, well, we're, it looks like we're going to work our way through this entire episode. So let's continue. Over the years, Bethel has, in various ways, provided the city with a lot of money, including more than $1.5 million to the police department alone. But Annalise says there's no real evidence that anything illegal is going on. There's no evidence of that. Um, There's no evidence that Bethel somehow donated money and in exchange received favor. There's a lot of, of course, speculating, suspicions, concerns. One of these concerns is that all these donations, that was just Bethel paying off the city for future building permits. And there were some extremely controversial building permits that were later granted. Permits for Bethel's new 39-acre church and school campus, a state-of-the-art campus with an estimated cost of nearly $100 million dollars. They've secured the absolutely huge property, but fundraising is still underway. And Bill Johnson says when complete, it will allow Bethel to follow through with a God-given mandate to, quote, host the nations in greater capacity. What a terrifying thought to people who already feel like Bethel is overshadowing the whole town. Okay. Now, here is where you have to start asking some questions. They gave, what, a million dollars to the police force? That's that's interesting. That's a lot of money for a church. Should Is it the church's mandate to fund the local police? That Like that, this gets into some theological questions. Should the church be funding local police? That That's... I, you know, I think I think we'll get a lot of different opinions there. It's like, is that the church's job? Um, and how much was that that property? Let's back that up. Let's back that up because I don't I don't want to I don't want to give a I, I'm bad with numbers, so that's why I've got to back this up a little bit. So let's back this up. Okay, here we go. Let's let's see if we have backed it up far enough. Extremely controversial building permits that were later granted. Permits for Bethel's new 39 acre church and school campus, a state of the art campus with an estimated cost of nearly $100 million. A 39-acre campus at a cost of $100 million. This is the big uh, business of church. This is the big business of Christianity. Is that wrong? Is that how much money should a ministry? I mean, if you're going to build a campus, a 39 acre campus at an estimated cost of a hundred million dollars, can you even imagine how much money? And they gave a million dollars to the police force. Can you imagine how much money is flowing in and through Bethel Church? Can we even begin to even try to process how much money is there? Now, when you when you have that much money, when you have that much money involved, is that wrong? 
Is that right? How much is too much? When when does it become problematic? When does it become problematic? Um, and, and and put it this way: if if it's not problematic now, will it become a source of major problems later? Because a lot of times, the more money that get, comes pouring into a ministry, the more problems that develop later. I. I don't know, but I mean, when you hear that, those are staggering numbers. I mean, of course, I cannot even comprehend. First, I can't even comprehend having a 39-acre campus. I can't even imagine building anything that cost uh, cost $100 million. I can't even imagine being a church that can give the local police force up a million dollars. I can't even wrap my mind around any of those numbers. I cannot. I mean, obviously, I will never be able to wrap my mind around it. So because I've never been in a ministry like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor of a little church in the middle of literally nowhere, Texas. I, I went, what, 10 years, 12 years, 13 years without taking a dime from the church. And the only thing the church does now is provide me, um, uh, well, I have a card that I can put gas in the car. And considering gas prices continuing to go up, I'm very grateful for that because it's, what, a 20-minute drive here, 20-minute drive back home. So I'm grateful for that. And then they uh, pay my house payment, which is a great blessing because if they didn't do that, I would have to have a job. So um, so that is – I'm very thankful for that. But that's it. And then as far as that, I mean, we – our building's paid for. That That's – we're, 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 we're grateful for that. But if you drove past our building, you could, you could immediately see things that we need to work on. We, things we need to improve on things that we could uh, spend money on, uh, that we don't have the money to, to spend. So I, I, it's hard for me, like it's, it would be easy for me to cr- criticize, wouldn't put it this way. It would be easy for me to try to criticize churches with large budgets. That would not necessarily be fair. I'm just saying that I can't understand that. I can't, I can't wrap my mind around being a part of a ministry that's building a 39-acre campus with an estimated cost of $100 million, and we have so much money that you're able to give a million dollars to the local police force I, over time. Um, I, I, that, that is all. But I guess when you have, what, 11,000 people attend a Bethel Church on, I think, a regular basis, I think it's 11,000, then, of course, you're going to be bringing in all of that money. And then, you, you, you I mean— yeah, you we could we could talk all day about this. Put it this way, I'll leave it I'll leave it before you to make some of those determinations. I think we just got to be very careful not to judge but it raises lots of questions about money and ministry. When is too much too much? When is too big too big? Is there is there ever a time where too much money is too much money? How much can how much money can a pastor make or how much money should a pastor make? There nobody has a specific Number. It's very difficult. Everyone thinks that, oh, that's too much, but who determines that? At the same time, one of the qualifications is not to be greedy for filthy lucre. Not, in other words, not doing ministry for money. But at what point does it cross over that you're doing? Like, how do you even judge that? And um, when when people on the outside see that, they're like, what is, look, look at that. That's just big business, money, 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 money. Look at them building all these buildings. They're just, they immediately critique that. They immediately criticize that. But, but that doesn't necessarily mean their, their criticism is correct. But how, how should Christians approach a lot of these subjects? I, I guess I'm going to just leave it more bef- before you than, than try to offer any answer. But we only got like six minutes left. So let's finish this. They've secured the absolutely huge property, but fundraising is still underway. And Bill Johnson says when complete, it will allow Bethel to follow through with a God-given mandate to, quote, host the nations in greater capacity. What a terrifying thought to people who already feel like Bethel is overshadowing the whole town. Okay. Um, I'm Robert. Robert is a graduate of Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, and he lived in Reading for nearly five years. Uh, my last name is Luyasinovich, which is really difficult. Um, I can spell it out for you later, I'm sure. Robert started BSSM in the fall of 2002. He'd been sponsored by a church that he'd got involved with after he graduated high school. This was back in his home state of Nevada. Because I was kind of in a situation where I had no money. I was just dropped off in Reading. Um, I was given a little bit of cash and told, go find a place to live with some other students and we'll send you money for like your bills. 
Robert is originally from the former Yugoslavia. His family moved to America when he was six, first to New York, and then Reno when he was a teenager. Nevada, Reno, Nevada, that's where Robert says he got mixed up with drugs and started getting into trouble a lot. But eventually, he started hanging out with a different crowd. So I ended up just hanging out with a group of friends that were into skateboarding and sports, and they also happened to be Christians. Um, so they would do these events at their church where they'd have like skate ramps outside and then you could skate but there for as long as you want, but you had to like go into the service or I don't know. I don't know if it was even a rule, but it was like expected, like people would be out there staring at you if you didn't. Um, so I ended up just going in and then I just was like, well, I mean, this is whatever, like all my friends are doing this and I don't want to go back to like my old group of friends. So this is kind of like, I need to fit in and just kind of like join this crowd. So I ended up just like going to church a lot and most of the time not believing anything. Um, for me, it was just like a way to hang out with my friends more. Not long after joining this church group, still fairly fresh out of high school, the leaders of this Reno congregation offered him the chance to attend Bible school. And I had my pick of a seminary in Oregon or something with the word supernatural in it. And that's how Robert wound up at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. I mean, a lot of the things that people do, like the students will go out and pray for people in public. And it, they got to a point where certain businesses banned them from coming in unless they were buying something. Um, because they would just start talking to everybody, putting their hands on people. You know, if there was a woman in a wheelchair, like everybody would just like mob them like a bunch of zombies and start praying for them. And it, it, was, it was just wild. So the public really did not appreciate the students. Like there was constantly like kind of like a point of contention with Reading um, citizens and all these students that come from everywhere, you know. In a normal year, BSSM welcomes about 2,500 students. 40% of them are international. But wherever they're coming from, they all need a place to stay. And for many of them, a way to financially support themselves. At the time, like I had a really hard time finding a job in Reading when I first got there because unemployment was really high. It's just a small town, you know. The only real jobs are like retail or like, you know, basic service jobs. And I remember having a hard time finding a job. And they told me that a witch had put a curse on me. And I said, oh, I don't know if I know any witches. And they said, do you know, do you know any, are there any lesbians that you knew that you're friends with from back home? And I said, yeah. And they were like, well, is there a chance they could be witches? And I said, I don't know. And they're like, well, they could be. I said, okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of like weird stuff that they would bring up that didn't make, really make a lot of sense. But at the time you're like, well, I don't know if they're witches or not. So maybe. I mean, I can't get a job. Maybe that's why. You know, you just get so indoctrinated and just this is all you hear and all you breathe every day, all day. And you're only listening to their music. You're only reading their books. And outside of school, you're only hanging out with other students. So you never really get a chance to like get a breath, you know. Eventually, Robert did get a job and a decent place to live and actually completed all three years of the BSSM program. One of the most striking things when I showed up was that um, they often said from the pulpit that God did not choose for revival to come to Reading, but he, he, God chose Bill Johnson, and then Bill Johnson chose Reading. And that's one of the things they repeated constantly, because they always talked about Bill Johnson as the apostle, you know? And so since he's the apostle... God has anointed him for like revival and he chose Reading to be the place. So there was always this thing where like whenever there was any strife or contention or, or things were bad between Bethel and like people who lived in Reading, there was always this thing like, yeah, but this is our city. So it's not really yours. Next time on Heaven Bent.
Hello, everyone. Today is the day, registration day for BSSM, uh, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. It's a very interesting model because essentially, you know, these students are paying for the privilege to work for the city of Reading for free. They do have us all, of course, wearing masks, which during worship is a little weird to try and sing with a mask on your face. I had no idea what it was. I just thought it was like a group of Christians, and for some reason, they had an emphasis on doing things supernatural. I just thought the supernatural meant paranormal. Like, I thought it had something to do with ghosts. And I was like, well, that seems like a crazy place. That might be fun. There you go. You can subscribe again to Heaven Bent anywhere you get your podcast. Just please note there at the end, if it sounds weird, that person who was sent to that school just seems interesting. It seems like he, I mean, the way he comes across, he wasn't even, it wasn't, he He shows no sign that he would ever actually became a believer, that he was just kind of hanging out and they said, hey, you want to go to this Bible school? Yes, but it, it doesn't show that he ever had even really believed. He didn't seem to even understand basic things. So that that that's kind of a weird part of the story. And some of the things like you can't get a job because you're under a curse, because you know lesbians who could be a witch, like, all right, so that's just, but again, that's just someone's account. We got to, got to take that. We got to make sure we don't forget that. That's just someone's, their, their side of the story. But it is interesting. Another aspect of charismatic theology that is prominent in some streams of charismatic theology is this idea that the, there's still apostles today. We have apostles who have apostolic power and apostolic authority, which Obviously, I reject the apostles were specific people who had to meet specific requirements, and the apostles, as they passed, there is no more apostolic succession, and that office is no longer. Um, But, of course, they continue, and if you have someone who's an apostle, they have lots of authority, they supposedly hear directly from God, and then people will listen to what they have to say, which then starts leading you into almost a cult mindset. Not saying it is. But that cult mindset starts showing up there. And the way he described it is, you know, you listen to their music, you hang out with them, you read their books. If And I'm not saying that Bethel says you can't read or, or listen to anything else, but that mindset becomes very cultish. And that's why I've all, I always try to tell my people, no, here's that book over there that goes against what, go read it. Go read that, listen to that, listen to that, read that, listen to that, read that, listen to that. Because I think truth will prevail and just trying to keep people away from anything that disagrees with you is very cultic. I'm not saying that's what Bethel does, but it sounds like whether intentionally or unintentionally, that's the atmosphere that was possibly created, at least in the mind of that individual that was speaking. But that's the Heaven Bent podcast Please subscribe. This whole season is going to be about Bethel Church. You can draw your own conclusions about it, but Bethel Church is one of the most influential churches in the United States of America. To not be aware of its influence and not to know about it is foolish because uh, ignoring its influence does not make it go away. So you need to be able to see its influence, spot it, know, oh, that's from Bethel, know what it is so that one, you're protected from it and you can protect other people from it because I do believe Almost anything coming out of the charismatic world is, uh, well, corrupt and polluted, and it takes away from biblical Christianity. All right. Sorry we went over an hour with that, but as always, whenever we start talking, there's always so much to discuss. So there you have it. If you have any questions, email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. I'll try to be back on the air here shortly. God bless.